It is my real honor to introduce my dear friend, Sue Magoo Coulter. We've known each other for a long time. We've been uh, co-workers. We're uh, neighbors. We are uh, just go through life side by side in many ways, which is a real honor. And Sue is a wonderful teacher. She's amazing to watch in action. And she's also truly inspirational. So before I get started with my talk, I just wanted to let you know a few things about Noyo Center. If you haven't checked out our Slack Tide Cafe down in the Noyo Harbor, I highly recommend it. Tasty breakfast and lunch foods, coffee, tea, all kinds of yummy stuff. And you get to watch river otters and seals and sea lions bobbing in the water and seagulls flying by. And it's just like the, such the pulse of the harbor hanging out on our back deck. So uh, Thursday through Mondays, eight to three, come on down and get yourself something yummy and tasty and have some dynamic staff wait on you and beautiful views. So a plug on that note. And then we also have a new exhibit at our downtown discovery center, seeing scientifically it's a collaboration with the, uh, exploratorium. And so it's microscopic life projected up on a screen that you can touch and check out, learn out about, about rotifers, which are these outrageous, microscopic life forms and watch them eat their algae and just check it all out. So those are two kind of newer things going on with the Noyo Center. So before I uh, share my screen and get started, I wanted to say thank you all for being willing to come and tune in on a topic like plastics because it's kind of a mixed blessing um, to discuss it. Uh, it's not exactly the easiest topic. It's a really big topic. I'm by no means an expert. I just um, went down the rabbit hole many years ago and <laughs> now I know a lot more information. And in just talking to people, realize that the information I know, a lot of people don't know. So I thought, okay, we should have a talk about this. So um, I might need to refer to my notes at some times because not all of it thankfully isn't up in my brain. I'm going to do my best not to overload you with the heavy aspect of it, but also be real about that part and more so um, focus on solutions and hopefully hopefully inspire you to make some kind of shift in your own life um, around plastics. So I'm going to go for sharing the screen. Hopefully you all can see that. You can see it, right, Sarah? Looks good, Sue. Okay, well, I'm going to put it onto, um, uh, what do you call it, slideshow. So we've got plastics, impacts to solutions. So let's see, is it going to let me forward it? Hold on one sec. Oh, there we go. All right, so just to give you a little overview of what all, how I'm going to flow with my talk, I just want to give you a little brief uh, history of the influences in my life that have helped shape me into uh, the steward, activist, lover of the earth, sharer of information, person that is sitting before you here in the virtual realms, give a little history of plastics, the impacts, what's the deal with recycling, solutions, share a little bit about what Noyo's efforts have been in the past and what we're doing presently, and then give you some time for any questions. So without any further pause, a little bit of information about me. I'm an East Coaster uh, transplant, moved out here in 89, grew up in uh, suburbia outside of Manhattan. I was the girl that climbed trees and uh, had to have my mom ring the bell multiple times before I came in from playing out on the street back when kids used to play on the street. And um, one of the things that stuck in my mind was an advertisement back then. And I'm going to date myself, and I'm sure some of you might remember this. I don't know if it was on the West Coast or not, but they used to have an advertisement back in the 70s of a Native American chief with a big feather headdress standing on the side of the road. And it's a little segment where somebody drives by and throws trash at his feet, and this little tear comes down his face. And that, as a kid, left a really huge impression on me. I was like, yeah, that's, that's not good. And then in fifth grade, my teacher, Mr. Papierman, was the first person ever in my life to even bring up the idea of recycling and even coordinated and let us bring our aluminum because back then that was the big trend was to recycle aluminum. <laughs> was to bring our aluminum in and weigh it and you know compete with who brought it. Yeah. And then he also taught us about 
conserving water when you're brushing your teeth, don't leave the tap running, about turning off lights when you're not in the room, or you're, you know, the light's not on in the room that you're not in. So he planted seeds in addition to that advertisement. And then in college was my first time I kind of got into an activism aspect of life when I found out they were logging the uh, Amazon forest to raise cheap cattle for beef for fast food restaurants. And um, confession that I used to eat at McDonald's in high school. <laughs> Been a vegetarian since uh, my early 20s, so thankfully that's not a habit of mine anymore. But I was uh, totally alarmed that that would happen, that they could destroy nature to create something for convenience. And then um, I'll go into a little bit more later uh, that Janet Self of Flockworks and Noyo Center of Me collaborated on a great plastics um, using the intersection of art and science back, I guess, five or six years ago at this point. So that's just to set the little tone of my um, history of how I came to be a earth loving supporter and protector. So when did our culture of convenience begin? So I found it interesting that the whole throwaway living got um, shifted and put out into like the advertisement realms in the 1950s as this uh, old fashioned Im image here shows you. And then we got guided to be good consumers as the one image says, try long lasting consumerism. And back then people were into entertaining. So these are various choices of paper plate Chinette sets that you could just toss so you don't have to do the dishes when you're done entertaining. And then enter in plastics when that cardboard became too soggy for those drinks. We needed to have plastic to hold our cups. I mean, excuse me, hold our drinks and things like that. So that happened, started, seemed to be like in the 50s and just kept on progressing from there. And I'm by no means, I'm a, um, a formal poet, but one of the things I like to do sometimes is take words and then use the letter of the word and come up with a, like kind of a, it's not really a haiku, but come up with a word for each letter. So when I was contemplating how to even begin to have this talk come together, I woke up in the morning and it was like, all of a sudden it was like plastics, plastics. Okay, what could I do? So I came up with this. Powerfully long lasting ability to stay together in all capacities synthetically. Kind of sums up plastics right there. So now to share just a brief history of plastics because talk about a rabbit hole. <coughs> we could go down that one and spend way too much time on that. Um, so to begin with, plastics are a polymer. Some of you might already know what a polymer, but in case you don't know, it's a series of molecules connected up in a long strand. And we have natural polymer, polymers and synthetic ones. And as the name implies, natural polymers you can find from li living organisms and in nature are DNA, rubber, cellulose, wool, and then synthetic poly polymers, as the name implies, made from synthetic kind of chemical reactions in the lab, nylon, polyester, Teflon, epoxy. And then what I like about this slide is it just shows you the images in nature and some of the things I didn't even think about before I started to kind of unravel plastics, cotton, wood, rubber, even our friends, the shelled animals, chitin is what makes up their hard shells, food, things that I, like I said, never thought about as being polymers before. And then the obvious, as far as the synthetic ones go. So. Development of plastics timeline. From what I researched, probably the very earliest, um, uh, let's see, earliest that I saw as far as a precursor to plastics was back in 1839. Charles Goodyear came up with natural rubber. I'm guessing it's Goodyear tires. So that was back in 1839. But the person that seemed to get the most attention or like was kind of like the starting point that I uh, found out about was Alexander Parks who was the um, individual who made the first man-made plastic. And um, it was publicly demonstrated in 1862 at the Great International Exhibit in London. The material was called Parkinson or Parkinson, and it was an organic material derived from cellulose that this man discovered that once it was heated, it could be modeled and retained its shape when cooled. 
So from what I gathered, it seemed like each person that came up with an invention around plastics kind of springboarded from the person before them. So um, next on that was the man in 1863, uh, John Wesley Hyatt, who came up with cellulose back when we used to make billiard boards from ivory. He came up with an attempted material that could substitute that, which from there also became um, first flexible photographic film. So like movies from the 1900s, the silent films, all of a sudden that was a whole new industry opportunity with the, the plastic film. Uh, 1872 was the first time uh, PVC came into the radar with Eugene Bauman as the, the inventor. And I'm not going to go through each year, but then um, some other key parts, 1938, Teflon. I know you all remember the, the days of Teflon. Uh, 1939, nylon, nylon and neoprene was invented, um, a replacement for silk. It was a synthetic rubber invented by Wallace Carruthers. 1941 was the first, um, this is the fun thing about trying to talk about plastics, polyethylene terephthalate, terif <laughs> essentially the um, PET plastics that the water bottles and soda bottles come in, that's when that got invented, 1941. And then um, the only other ones that I thought were interesting too, Saran Wrap introduced by Dow Chemicals in 1953, 1954 Styrofoam invented by um, Ray McIntyre from Dow Chemical as well. So just gives you an idea of how uh, that spanned over those years, but I was a little bit shocked 1800s um, was the early aspect of it. And it seemed that um, World War II kind of brought up a a need for lightweight and a different way of producing um, products for consumer usage. Um, and then the, interestingly enough, the first uh, plastic bottle used for soft drinks was um, widely, uh, was invented, excuse me, was, did not become widely used until the 1970s and it was um, produced in 1973. Um, and, and it was an engineer, Nathaniel Wyeth from uh, DuPont that came up with that. So that was a little bit, sooner than my brain remembered, but I was only four at the time, so understandable. And then in 1978, um, Coca-Cola and Pepsi introduced to the world the very first two liter soda bottle. And that was the big deal because you could take it picnicking and outside and it wouldn't break. Um, and then finally in 1999, Coca-Cola got, got conceded to the unavoidable um, aspect of creating the first brand of bottled water. So bottled water has been around since 1991. And then here's one of those just statistics that's not so fun to hear about, but I'm just going to share it because I think it's important to um, kind of grok the, the situation we're in. Uh, according to Science Magazine, about 8 million metric tons of land-based plastic ends up in the world's oceans each year, which is equivalent to five grocery bags of plastic on every foot of coastline around the world depressing fact, but it just kind of visually, I'm the girl, those of you that know me likes fun facts and kind of visual comparisons. Um, and then another aspect of it that's kind of uh, depressing is more than a quarter of ocean plastic likely originates from 10 rivers, eight of which are in Asia. So that's that idea. If we keep clean on the land, it won't end up out in the ocean as much. So the rivers are or where a lot of the trash is ending up, especially around the globe, and then bringing it out to the ocean. So, but I wanna not demonize plastic because there's a lot of really vital, important uses for it. And um, when it got invented, it wasn't probably what they were thinking about. And um, in our social media post, Trey was pointing out that little did the people who came up with these materials back in the 1800s, 1900s, thinking they would be helpful for us in our environment, didn't have that long range view to think out how it would impact our environment in the long run. But I have a friend's daughter who I saw in the ICU unit last month. She wouldn't be able to keep going in the way she is without the help of plastic. So the medical world is a really vital area where plastics are needed, scientific research, uh, automobiles, our technology, appliances, so there are some really um, valuable aspects to plastic that we need in our world at this point. We've, you know, um, grown into needing the, that uh, valuable resource 
or not resource, I don't want to call it resource, valuable material to help us um, in very important parts of our, our world. And then there's convenient uses, which we're all very much familiar with. The biggest one being the single use plastic. Essentially, the definition of single use, literally, you know, when we open up a chip bag, we eat the chips, go straight in the trash. Um, and so here you can see lots of examples of the single use plastic, unfortunately. And so shifting into impacts of plastic, very big, broad topic. I'm not gonna get too, um, too in depth, but you can already see from some of the images on the screen that it's obvious it's made from toxic chemicals, uh, made from fossil fuels, such as petroleum and natural gas. The manufacturing of it harms workers and pollutes communities and the environment. It's not biodegradable, truly it is not biodegradable. It's gonna be here long after all of us. Um, it pollutes the ocean, of course, harms wildlife, humans. And so the thing that um, I wanna really stress is that the plastic pollution isn't because of us being litter bugs. Uh, the plastic industry likes to insist that the pollution is the fault of the consumers and then and because we don't dispose of our waste properly um, but yet they continue to um, shift to single use and less options for us that aren't in plastic and then there's that assumption that they're recyclable and that's a whole nother topic I'm going to get to in a little bit and I guess the biggest problem um, to me from what I sensed I uh, watched a plastics webinar last fall um, that was very informative and it it shared the fact that our petroleum companies are got dollar signs in their eyeballs of course but especially because they're seeing what a viable um, moneymaker plastics are so sadly Exxon Mobil is working on a 10 billion facility 1300 acre complex in Texas um, the largest of its kind to be built for increasing plastic production Shell's working on a six billion dollar facility to be built in Pennsylvania and um, there's kind of this ramp up by a lot of them to increase the production over the next three to four years. 99% um, of plastics is made from fossil fuels, crude oil, coal, and natural gas. And with the, the big um, obsession with fracking, um, it's making the, uh, the cost of plastic really cheap to produce. Um, and as you can imagine, as the, the photograph shows with the factory, the production of it and the transportation of it creates greenhouse gases. Um, where we've got water, you know, pure water stored in plastic bottles. That's not really good for our health. Um, and so what can happen with the extraction and the transportation aspect is sometimes methane leaks happen. They do drilling for oil fuel combustion, land disturbance at forests, um, fields are cleared for pipelines or well pads, um, and a bulk of these issues, this is the, you know, the saddest reality to me, happen commonly in poor communities of color, creating health issues due to close proximity to the people's homes and communities. And then it's, it's, it's a kind of a privilege to try to choose other materials that aren't sold in plastic, so it's not economically viable to everybody. In, around the globe to be able to make a different choice than the plastics. Um, let me see, where am I? So yeah, sadly, okay, another couple of, just a warning. <laughs> it's not a violent movie, but I'm warning about a few gr gruesome statistics, but we're gonna move into solutions here sh shortly. Um, by 2025, there could be 17 billion pieces of plastic on coral reefs, which is equivalent to piece, two pieces of plastic per person on earth. Um, the other part that doesn't get discussed is, especially in California with the fires, the wildfires that we have, the air quality and unknown impacts of what plastics um, get burned, the materials that we build our homes in and stuff, um, what that impacts communities. There was an issue with uh, preeclampsia, which is a health issue for pregnant women in some areas of California. Um, and then I'm going to do two more not such great statistics, and then we'll move on to other things. Um, the other thing, microplastics, the technical definition of it is um, five millimeters, which is like pretty much the point of a pencil, so teeny tiny. Um, they're the biggest issue, as you can imagine, because 
you can't really see them in the water when they're that small. Um, and it's apparently 6.9 trillion pounds over the last decade of microplastics has been um, accumulating. So uh, the important thing is it's inspiring some um, companies in the textile industry and other people that are getting creative about how we can begin to shift away from using it, especially in our clothing, lease and stuff like that. Um, let's see. And then this next slide is not my most favorite because it's the truth and the reality of what's happening in our ocean, but I'm not gonna have a talk about plastics and not tie it to the ocean being that this is the Noyo Center. Um, so as far as marine life, 60% of the whales, 50% of all turtle species, and 90% of sea birds ingest plastics. Um, excuse me. Uh, and so, like I said earlier, the land trash that ends up on land be eventually becomes marine debris. And NOAA has defined uh, marine debris as being any persistent solid material that's manufactured or processed and directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally disposed of or abandoned into the marine environment or the Great Lakes. Essentially, if we keep our earth cleaner, we less will end up in the ocean is the, the hope of all that. Um, and then there is a organization called Break, Break Free from Plastics, and they do brand audits, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later in my talk, but they have done an inventory of who are our top contributors around the world, um, corporation-wise, as far as the worst polluters. So I thought, you won't be surprised to hear, Coca-Cola is on the top of the list, PepsiCo, Nestle, Unilever, Mondel Mondelez, Mars, P&G, Philip Morris, Colgate, Perfetti. So that's kind of uh, one of those places that I'm hoping when we get to the solutions that we can talk about some creative ways of how we can start making these corporations be responsible for what they're doing to um, our communities and the planet. So as you can see in the upper left-hand corner is a map with the image of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I'm sure you all have heard about it already. But the interesting thing, um, it's a term often used by the media and it doesn't paint an accurate picture of the marine debris problem in the North Pacific Ocean. Uh, marine debris concentrates in various regions of the North Pacific, but not, and not just in one area. So the exact size, content, and location is difficult to act accurately um, define it. And then the big reason it's misleading is that a lot of us think it's like, like probably what it looks like at a landfill where we think it's piled up chunks of trash that's on top of the water that you can see from all over. And apparently that's a big misconception. It's more like the image in the bottom left-hand corner where at the top of the ocean, probably the top 10, 15 feet is where a lot of the bulk and the chunkier pieces of it are. And then as it breaks down with that exposure to sun into the microplastics, it goes down into the further into the water column down deeper. So it's kind of a little bit, um, like I said, I was surprised to learn that it's not visually as obvious as we might all imagine. And as you can see, sea lions, birds, turtles, whales all get impacted upon it, excuse me, impacted by it. So let's shift to the, what's the truth about recycling or what's the deal with recycling? Nowadays, it seems more like it's wish cycling. We all, not maybe, not assuming any of you, but as a United States, as our, as our community in the United States, we might buy things and feel guilt-free because we put it in the recycling bin and we trust that it's gonna get recycled. And we went from being separating things into the different colored bins to now it's all in one container. And so what is the deal with recycling? Um, <clears throat> excuse me, bottom line is recycling without any reduction in production with plastics is really not a viable solution. Essentially, we're past the point of recycling our way out of our mess here with the plastics on this planet. But don't despair. Again, we're gonna talk about some solutions here shortly. Um, but the sad, the sad reality is 9% gets recycled in the United States, 12% uh, gets incinerated and 79% goes into the environment. So not exactly um, an optimistic set of statistics, but, and then, uh, not all of the, the plastics get recycled, but rather get exported to other countries. Um, our trash ends up around 
the other side of the globe because it's cheaper to ship it than to deal with it ourselves. And uh, as we now know, I think it was 2018 that China started to say no to our plastics, essentially because as Americans were lazy, we throw the yogurt with all the yogurt on the side of the container into the recycling bin. We throw the peanut butter container with a little bit of a jam jar. We just throw it away without rinsing it. Um, and so that they don't want to deal with it anymore. And we are sadly the number one plastic waste generating um, country in the world. So rely, relying on recycling is like trying to bail, um, bail us out of a sinking ship without patching the hole. So, uh, and the bottom line is the biggest um, culprit of the plastic use is packaging. 32% uh, of all plastic packaging pollutes the environment and 40% sits in our landfills. So um, what I'm proposing here is that uh, we get to know about these numbers. So there's this misconception that if there's the triangle and a number that it's automatically recycled. So I uh, chose to read a book, got it back here, Plastic, excuse me, yeah, Plastic, A Toxic Love Story by Susan Frankel. And um, that was a lot of information, really good information, but she was the first one to point out about the numeric system. So essentially the higher the number, the more uh, chemical cocktail it is and the less likely it gets recycled. So if we're lucky, the main one that gets uh, recycled are number ones, which is like soda bottles, um, bottled water, that kind of stuff. Sometimes number twos, but anything else has to be in a facility that can manage that particular number of plastic. So that right there is a, you know, a big contributor because everybody throws anything with those little wrapping triangle, you know, arrows around it in a triangle shape into the recycling. So what I wanna suggest here is with the hope that we can begin to turn the tide a little bit on this is to be more responsible about our attempts in recycling. So rinse containers out completely. I went on to check out our new, we now have a new waste management company, um, Redwood Recycles and then C&S Waste Solutions. So I couldn't help but go on their website and start looking at, you know, how, what they take and what exactly is the, um, you know, the, the range of stuff, because I noticed that waste management that we used to have didn't take anything over a number one or a number two plastic wise. And this new company takes up to number seven. So um, what I did find on, on it, surprisingly enough, is I myself have been, I've been collecting my bottle caps from whatever items I have because I'm going to do an art piece with them. But I thought, oh, you know, don't put the plastic caps in the recycling because they're not recyclable. So with this new company, they're saying if you keep the cap on the bottle, then the whole thing can just get recycled. But if you have loose caps and you throw them in the recycling, that's not going to work. So there's a new step you could try to incorporate, rinse out your containers. And if you do have bottles with caps, keep whatever bottle cap combo together because then they can get recycled together. Uh, the other thing that I was surprised about is um, the old waste management wouldn't take um, milk curtains, only in Ukiah. This newer company does, but I used to crush mine thinking that would save space. And what I learned from going on their site is that it's harder for those optical sorting technology at the different places along the, the, the trail that our trash and recycling goes um, that recognizes the shape. So it recognizes the square shape of a milk carton. It recognizes the square shape of those, um, what do they call them? Tetra packs, the, like the soy milk containers. So new step in my world is I'm not crushing things to make more space when I put it in my recycling container and then bring it out to my uh, bin to get picked up. So that's a couple of things you could think about changing. Uh, plastic bags, people don't put them into the, to, to the recycling. Um, the biggest issue being that um, they cause a lot of problems and get stuck in the sorting equipment down the, the line. Um, I do believe this new company will take plastic bags, but I don't know right now in this moment where the drop off is, but I highly recommend checking out the CNS Waste Solutions website to get yourself more informed. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I think that was all on that level. Thank you for bearing with me here. So, so yeah, so I guess for me, once I found out about the numbers, I couldn't bear to continue to buy the things that I like to buy. So what I have on me right here is, 
I'm the girl that likes to make smoothies and I used to buy frozen smoothies, but I picked the ones that had resealable Ziplocs, but I, I just decided, you know what, girl, you need to pick your own berries or buy your fruit at the farmer's market and freeze it. So I gave up frozen fruit. The other thing I like is yogurt. They went from doing yogurt, yogurt containers in a number two um, tub to number five, so a higher number. So I make my own yogurt. I make my own hummus. I make my own deodorant. I'm looking into figuring out how to make my own toothpaste. Um, so these are my ways that I'm just choosing to lessen my impact because I just, it's hard for me to feel okay about the fact that I'm an educator about the earth and I'm contributing to the problem myself. And then the, the skirt back here, you can't see it necessarily, but it's made out of one of my former favorite things, which is Annie Chun's organic vegetarian pot stickers. Single use bag, open it up, make my pot stickers, goes in the trash. I no longer buy that item. So this is again, just my steps that I'm doing. I'm not by any means trying to tell anybody how you should do your, your life. So. Uh, let's see. Let's move on to solutions. Yay! <laughs> so on a personal level, you know the drill. Reduce, reuse, recycle, refuse, refurbish. There's all these new R's added into it. Um, and the, the key thing is, is to remember that we are not responsible for this problem completely. We're at the mercy of the fact that we've um, evolved into this culture of throwaway convenience out of sight, out of mind. And so the corporations have caught on to that. And pretty much that's what we have for choices. I was in Connecticut a couple of years ago, went to buy my mom detergent and there was not one option of laundry detergent that wasn't in one of those big clunky, heavy duty plastic jugs, nothing in a cardboard box, nothing in a jug. So that right there, that's not a lot of choice. So we need to remember it's not just our, our um, part. We can move towards getting corporations to be responsible for what they produce. You can do cleanups. We have beach cleanups. We have uh, school campuses. We can help out main streets of downtown. We have a local man here who goes around and picks the cigarette butts up off the streets in Fort Bragg. Um, use our cloth bags, use our to-go mugs. Um, if there's a business you love and they're producing something that you don't want them to continue to produce, then perhaps approach the owner and see about getting a dialogue going. We like Calyx, maybe you like milkshakes. Who wants to continue to have straws and the little container over the top and the base to it? You know, maybe we make a suggestion to those businesses to shift their, their options that they're offering. Um, make your own stuff, bring your glass. I had a dinner confession at Craven Grill and I have my own reusable plastic lid and pint glass and my own straw and they actually were more than willing to fill my cup up with that and I just leave it in the back of my car I wash and reuse my produce bags I leave those in the back of my car with my cloth bags I've got my little to-go containers if I need I got my bamboo cutlery in my my glove box so these are just again things that you could choose to do if you get inspired to after taking in all the information I'm sharing with you um, and just review you know view recycling as a last resort not as like your go-to if you're able to do that. And you can support Break Free from Plastic um, Pollution Act, which I'll share a little bit more about what that act is about. Um, so again, these are ways that you can personally and you know start with one thing. That's what I did. I started by making my own hummus. That was easy enough. Then I was like, okay, I'm motivated. What can I do next? So, and then I put up on this screen here, you could choose to support organizations making positive impacts and efforts in this cause. BreakFreeFromPlastic.org, great organization. Uh, Clean Ocean Project, the Plastic Pollution Coalition, the Ocean Cleanup, they're my big inspiration. Really appreciate what those folks are doing. PlasticOceans.org. So those are just a couple of organizations. You can make a donation, um, you know, choose to find an organization if you don't want to use one of these that might, you know, uh, be one that you want to contribute to. Uh, besides anything else that you do in the way that you support the Noyo Center, of course, and then community level and beyond. So um, I'm all for trying to help work towards making having our local business begin to make more changes. Um, I don't know if Bridget Kelly's on the call tonight, but she and I were talking together because we both care about the issue of plastics and we're motivated to see if we can get the coast to go plastic free by 2035, maybe 2040, maybe 2035. 
I don't know, why not try? Then we could be not only a beautiful place to come, an ocean center with a 73 foot blue whale out on the headlands, cafe down in the harbor, discovery center here, but then it could be the destination of, wow, this beautiful community and they don't have any plastic in their restaurants or their to-go places. Um, can approach city council. Let's look at local legislation that we could create um, policy around these issues. Demand corporate change. Um, uh, what else? Let's see. Yeah. So like um, extended producer responsibility it makes the corporations accountable for the life cycle of their products. Uh, support break free from plastic pollution act, which pretty much bans single use items such as straws and plastic bags. We could start for that with that on the in on the coast and then try for it in the county. Um, fossil fuel industries get subsidies. Let's try to create legislation against that. That's ridiculous. When I read that, I couldn't believe it. We need to change the dominant narrative. We just have to at this point. We have to like rethink it, reconfigure it, and um, you know, go for it. Uh, shoot for building zero waste cities. Wouldn't that be exciting? Um, and work in synergy with other movements. There's already a lot of movement happening. So as for the Break Free from Plastic Act, I'm gonna use my notes here because I don't have this up in my brain. Uh, the bill makes certain producers of products like packaging, single use products, beverage containers, food service products, makes that um, producer fiscally responsible for collecting, managing, and recycling or composting the pro products after commute, excuse me, after consumer use. Uh, beginning in January 1st, 2023, the bill is gonna phase out a variety of single use products such as plastic utensils. Yes. Uh, the bill also sets forth provisions to encourage the reduction of single use products, including establishing programs to refund consumers who return the containers. Um, by establishing a tax on carry out bags and carry out containers. Uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA must publish guidelines for a national standardized labeling system for recycling and composting receptacles. And finally, the bill establishes limitations on the export of plastic waste to other countries. So this is great to know that this is an act that got voted in, I think in 2021. So it's already in motion, so let's support trying to help carry it out further. Another legislative bill that's happening in California is uh, SB 54. Um, it requires all packaging in the state to be recyclable or compostable by 2032, cutting plastic packaging by 25% in 10 years and requiring 65% of all single use plastic packaging to be recycled in the same time frame. Um, See, looks like on October 5th, 2021, uh, Governor Newsom signed um, a truth in labeling for recyclable materials bill. And by January, 2024, the Department of Resources for Recycling is required to provide information to the public to evaluate whether a product or packaging is recyclable. So that one I really like because it's informing the consumer of what is actually going to be recycled. So those are a couple of um, acts. And I'm happy to say that at least in California, thankfully, being kind of a the state that sets the example for the other states, um, we have several bills that are either in the process of being going to be voted on that are tied to plastics issue. So um, I wanted to share here, I just, um, I'm on the uh, newsletter for the Ocean Cleanup Organization who I am so inspired. Uh, Boyan, Boyan Slat is a I think he's a young man from Denmark. He did a TED talk um, back when he was like a teenager about the issue of plastics, ended up going viral and it totally changed his life And that now he's created this organization, Ocean Cleanup. He's like in his mid twenties, he's the CEO of it. And they're doing incredible things all over the globe to um, capture plastics. They've got boats that are either electric or solar powered or low impact. Um, on, in how they run them and then netting that doesn't catch animals and uh, affect the marine life. So they just installed um, intercept, interceptor, I'm gonna read from the slide, I don't usually like to, but interceptor 007 was installed in Los Angeles County um, at the, in advance of the first floods of the storm 
excuse me, storm season. So essentially it's um, a boat that goes up the river. It's got a conveyor belt and a way of, of kind of um, directing the, the plastic trash up the conveyor belt. Then it goes up into bins and then it gets, the boat comes to land where it's met by a truck that then takes it to the next level. So they did this down in Los Angeles. They're involved around the, the globe. They've got a bunch of um, boats on the rivers in Asia that are producing a lot of the plastics. So I just wanted to have this as a, this is one organization that's truly determined to have plastics go away in the ocean. So, and then another one that I thought was interesting that I found out about, there's a company called Brightmark that's um, dedicated to having circular so solutions to plastic and waste that I was impressed with that I found. And then I just got on their newsletter. And so this was a, a highlight today that I got in my email that um, Larson family is a fourth generation dairy farm. And so together with Brightmark, they are operating anaerobic digesters that collect um, methane from cow manure and deliver it back into local um, gas pipelines as energy for use of homes and businesses. So again, two different ends of the spectrum, dairy farmer, business trying to do new solutions with our trash and plastics coming together and collaborating. So I think that's what it's gonna take, a lot of collaboration for us and inspiring other companies and farms and organizations to do the same. And then as far as Noyo's efforts in the past, I mentioned earlier in my talk that uh, Janet Self and I were fortunate enough to collaborate and um, work together. Uh, we had a, we called our, um, our work, it was upwelling, using the term for upwelling off the coast with this idea of um, using uh, art, the intersection of art and science to help um, inform youth and community about marine science and um, plastics in the ocean. So the photos here are from a display that we had um, several years ago. And the photo on the left hand of the screen and the left hand of that photo, one of our interns, Tanaya Mazur, uh, created that from beach trash that was collected here locally. And she glued it onto fishing line and hung it on a copper spiral as to just give people a an up close and personal connection to plastics getting collected off our beach. Um, Janet and I collected water bottles and had a whole art project where kids could cut them up and make them look like little ocean critters. Um, we also collaborated and were in several 4th of July parades in Mendocino and we got into um, Paul Bunyan one of the years as well. So that's another way art can help us um, inform uh, communities about what's going on. Bridget Kelly and I and Leah, who's connected to the Fort Bragg mural project, we're going to meet in a couple of weeks about creating a mural involving plastics or some way to incorporate plastics um, and creating an art piece somewhere in Fort Bragg. And, um, and then present, we are so fortunate to have received a grant from California Coastal Commission. Thank you to all of those of you that actually pay extra for the whale tail license plate because that money goes into grant funding. And so those of you that know me personally know that I broke my leg last uh, August, and so I was pretty much um, couch potato for a bit of time and wrote a grant um, to the Coastal Commission for the whale tail grants, and we got awarded. And so our grant is called Talking Trash Again, Making Choices That Support a Healthy Ocean. My coworker, Michael, who's on the call, he and I have been working on developing the curriculum. And what I'm excited about this um, project, it is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, project in that we're gonna go into local school classrooms, high school level science classes, and um, do what's called a trash audit. Um, I think I have a photograph of one in here, laying out a tarp and um, having, you know, of course, safely with gloves and grippy grabbers and stuff, sorting it out, what's going to the landfill, number one plastic, number two plastic, number three, single use. And then we're taking an inventory of the brands. Um, you know, was it a soda bottle? Was it a seaweed packet? And then that information will get uploaded to the Break Free from Plastics website. And then it'll go into their big bank um, and track who's the big contributors around the globe. They even encouraged us to mail the um, items back to the corporations. So uh, we'll go into the high school classrooms, we'll teach them on their level about uh, what's getting recyclable, if it is, the chemical cocktail of plastics, how it impacts the environment, the way that it's made, microplastics, and then also personal choice, um, talking about how they can begin to look at their choices of what they buy, 
differently and then have them go into the eighth grade science class and teach the eighth graders a little bit less you know information maybe not going into all the same details um, and then have the eighth graders go into the fifth grade classes and teach the fifth grade classes so peer to peer and then the fifth graders will make art from the plastic trash seventh graders we hope to do a little bit of poetry with so they have an outlet to express themselves around this because it's kind of intense information to share and I don't want them to feel responsible I just want to have them feel informed and I also know that we deal with low income and um, you know diversity of different backgrounds in our community so I'm I'm my approach is to just share the information, not have any assumption that anybody can go home and make the changes at home. Um, we met with Fort Bragg High School science teachers last week. They're so excited to have this happen. They think it's gonna be um, a place where the kids can put their energy and feel like they're helping out with climate change. So we've had really positive um, responses from the teachers. I put it out to them before we got the grant and they were like, yes, let's do it. So we will be launching that um, shortly. And so that's exciting. And um, so lastly, do something drastic, cut the plastic, go green, say no to single use plastic. Uh, keep calm and keep with the earth clean. And then I came up with a, another um, poem using the plastics. This one has a kind of a more of a solution and positive outlook. Purposeful, loving attention of science, technology, integrating community solutions. And so keep calm, know that we can do this together and together we can do anything. So I will. So I know that was a lot of information, <laughs> but I uh, did my best to like take the topic, bring it in and hopefully inspire you to just Looks be- like an owl to me. Maybe <laughs> better move Thank you, everybody, for being on board and checking this out. So you did, so you did a fabulous job. I've learned oh. so much. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I've got questions. Okay, good. <laughs> so one of the things I learned was that a lot of uh, waste comes from rivers, and I didn't realize that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're lucky here, of course, because it's minor compared to other places. But yeah, that's how it all ends up, you know, running off down to the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah. So that's definitely one of the things we want to impart on the children is to make the connection that if we can keep the schoolyard clean and the neighborhood clean, then it'll stay out of the ocean. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And let me see in the chat if there's any questions. Oops. Uh, let's see. Nancy mentioned that maybe at Safeway stores, um, they'll often have a bin for plastic bag recycling. And I know Harvest had that as well. And COVID, that was one of the things that knocked us back a bit was that that way to bring your plastic bags in and, and yeah. push them down into a cube as best you could and then get them there. So that is... I don't know if that's happening for sure at Harvest or Safeway, um, but it's one of those things that you can put in their donation or they're in their suggestion box to yeah. try to uh, get that up and running um, or do like Sue and I and Pam and all of us that we, we recycle those plastic bags. They become wash and use them again, wash and use them again. Um, yeah. They have many lives. Um, I got extras Sarah? if anybody needs any. <laughs> yeah, Sarah? Yes, I, I would like to say that at, I've been at Corners for a long time and Corners has always taken their plastic bags. Uh, it was first just Safeway, but Harvest Market does it also. So Wonderful. I can confirm that. Excellent. Thank you. OK. And you. Um, I really love the suggestion. I didn't realize not to smash the aseptic yeah. cartons. I know. Right. And I've always done it it's like safe space exactly. in that container. So great suggestion. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Like I said, I've just learned a few things just by taking that step to go and look online. So yes. that's the part is we just don't get clearly told how it's supposed to be. Yep. That's, that's true. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I didn't even touch the fact that COVID definitely helped us increase 
our plastics that we all don't need to. Oh my goodness. We already know that. We don't need to go into that. So yeah, the to go thing. Yep. Yeah. One thing I wanted to say, one thing that that Sue, I think, taught me or said to me that I took as a real pearl of wisdom, because this can be really overwhelming, but she came back from one of the conferences or something just saying that if we each do what little bit we can do, everybody on this call, some of you have electric vehicles, some of you are making sure to make your own toothpaste. Some We're all doing different things. And the important thing to take home is that if we all continue to do what little parts that we can and continue to grow those little parts that we can do, that the bigger, it will take a bigger effect. It will, it will snowball, so to speak. Um, and don't get overwhelmed because that's, then you just freeze up and you can't do anything. Um, I think Karen said something about how we offer a weekly plastic free meeting at the Slack Tide Cafe. When the Noya Center became a, a, a cafe, we were going to run a cafe, we had to look long and hard at how are we going to do that in the best way possible and to use as many as as few packaging items and all of that like it's a big challenge but um you can definitely walk in there and have a plastic free experience as 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 best as possible we've got beautiful mugs and so forth um karen was there something else that you had to say about that you know i would like to say something to sky again um that i've been to slack tide cafe a couple times and I love the food and I love the view. And you go there, you got an outdoor space, you have an indoor space that, you know, and it's all good depending on the weather. Um, and the view is beautiful and the food I was really impressed with. And that's why I went back the second time. Thank you, that's so sweet. Nice little lunch, really. Very nice lunch. Yeah. Hi, yes. this is Karen. Yeah, what I what I was thinking is that it might be nice to offer, you know, maybe a weekly or a monthly get together so we can talk about how to reduce our plastic That's use great. at home. I love it. Great. Yeah, that sounds good. I could see monthly being realistic, just knowing busy lives, but that's a fantastic idea. Thank you for that. Yeah, yep. we could zoom it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, and we hope to eventually... Um, we have a grant that we put request for certain materials. Um, eventually we hope to have the machinery to chomp up plastic and then use it to do 3D printing so that we're not using pure new plastic to create 3D printing type of stuff. So that's one thing we hope to get happening down the line. And the only other thing that I just realized I didn't mention about the recycling, the problem is especially with like like the number one plastics, is it's really getting downcycled, which means that it's getting turned into things like carpet and clothing, and then new plastic is being used to make new bottles. Oh. So if okay. we could get that to stop and get Coca-Cola and Pepsi to take, you know, the plastic bottles and, you know, take that plastic to make more, that would be good as well. So, so something I think of is uh, Sky again. Something I think of is like, one of the things about plastics um, is that it's made from petroleum, Yeah. right? Yeah. So when it was first introduced, they didn't have petroleum. And so it was all plant-based polymers, right? Yeah. yeah. And so it must've been the forties, fifties that the petroleum, well, probably earlier than that, the petroleum started being produced and it's got harder to um, manage it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the other downside that you just brought up to me is that we, we come up with these compostable plastics, but they need to be brought to a facility that manages just that type of plastic. Yes. So sadly, yep. we put that in recycling and I don't know that that's right. getting recycled. Right. <laughs> So yeah. and I'm thinking, why not create something like that in the county? It'd be great if like a business, you know, if we created a, a bi yes. you know, compostable plastics facility in Mendocino County, how fantastic would that be? I don't know. That's where I go is I'm like, how can we? <laughs> Understood. Uh, any other questions, Sarah, that I, anybody has? 
Yeah, no, just lots and lots of appreciation for oh, you. Good. People loved your presentation and were really, really um, inspired by you. Lots of compliments. And one little factoid that came up that Goodyear, the reason they have that little shoe and the wings is because that they first made uh, soles for shoes. Oh, uh, that's but, right. I had forgotten yeah. that. Thank you for that reminder. That's right. That's <laughs> I totally right. forgot that. That's right. Oh my gosh. Wild. Yeah. Um, All right. yeah. Any other questions? And if you don't have a question, if you if you want to put out like if anybody has that what they've done, I know that I'm super happy to say that I no longer buy shampoo bottles, which was with two teenagers in the house. We were going through shampoo bottles like nobody's business. And the the bar, you can buy it at, at any of our stores locally and just use a shampoo so like a soap bar. And it's great. I love it. So if anybody has any ideas that they wanted to share or other questions for Sue, feel free. Well, you just brought up for me that I use reusable containers and I buy bulk shampoo at Corners, bulk conditioner and bulk moisturizer. So that's another option you can do is just get the container and refill it. So many different ways you can do the th your thing, that's for sure. But thank you, Sue, welcome. so much. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you for joining. Good on you. And Sarah, thank you for the work you do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, community. Thank you, yes, everybody. Thank you all That's for your right. support, for tuning in. I know it was a lot of information, but I just wanted you to feel a little bit more informed. Yes. <laughs> and I am. Power. Yep. Good night. Yeah, good night. Thank you.